Ask the congregation to please stand for evening prayer, service of lights. Evening prayer, service of light, page 243, page 243. my apology it's the service of vespers service of vespers page 229 page 229 my apologies to deliver me. continue this evening with Psalm chapter 1, sung to the chanting tune of H, printed on the inside of your bulletin. be seated for office hymn, office hymn number 611, office hymn number 611.
reading from Romans, the seventh chapter. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the very evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Put my trust, leave me not, O Lord my God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm not sure if you realize it or not, but every single Sunday in the divine service, yes, right here in this sanctuary, in these pews, you and I confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. Now, for some of you in here tonight, I look out and see many faces. Some of you, you've been saying this for over 90 years. For over 90 years, confessing in this sanctuary that you are, yes, that you are sinful and unclean. For others of you, it's been a short time since you may, maybe perhaps have recently joined the church. But whether you are young or old, nonetheless, we all come to this sanctuary and we confess, confess that we are poor, miserable sinners in thought, word, and deed. And we do that our entire life for decades upon decades. And here's the catch when we think about this. There's no exception clause to the confession of sin. There's no choose your own ending. If you happen to have a good week, you don't say it. In other weeks where it's bad, you do say it. No, nonetheless, no matter what is going on in your life, you confess. When things are going bad, well, it's easy. You stand up and you confess. And when things are going well, guess what? You confess as well. You confess your sins. We also see this in the prayers. Think about the hundreds, no, the thousands of times that you have prayed the Lord's Prayer. You pray and you ask in that Lord's Prayer, you pray for the forgiveness of your trespasses. Indeed, no matter what season of life, no matter how good things are or how bad things are in your life, you continue to pray that Lord's Prayer. In season and out of season, you ask for the forgiveness of your sins, the forgiveness of your trespasses. Now, many well-meaning people think that we are wrong, yes, that we are wrong in St. Paul's, wrong in the Lutheran faith for confessing that we are by nature sinful and unclean. In fact, they teach that once a person becomes a Christian, once they have that dynamic conversion, that he or she is no longer a sinner. And since a Christian is no longer a sinner, according to their theology, their philosophy, their way of thinking, well, there's no longer a need for confession. 
Now, you may or may not know this, but the famous televangelist Joyce Meyer, who used to be, yes, Missouri Synod, she said it this way once, and I quote, I am not poor, I am not miserable, and I am not a sinner. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is what I were, and if I still was, then Jesus died in vain. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I didn't stop sinning until I finally got it through my thick head. I wasn't a sinner anymore. End quote. Now, there are others who oppose this regular confession of sin as well. There are so-called Christians who walk around with their noses high in the air, acting like they do not struggle with sin anymore. That sin is a little thing that they conquered a long time ago. They pretend that all is well with them and they're living a victorious life. And when you talk to them, you certainly do not hear their failings. You hear all about what they are doing and how good things are. Well, my friends, these individuals are misinformed. That's perhaps the best construction. They're wrong. And probably most likely, they're most likely naive at best. You see, plain reason and experience shows us that we Christians, that we struggle with sin. Just take a look at our own lives. Just examine everyone else around us. We do. We struggle with sin. Not just in the past, but every single day. But why do we struggle with sin even though we're baptized? Perhaps that's a good question. Why do we struggle with sin even though we're baptized? Well, my friends, sin itself, it remains after baptism. Yes, sin remains after your baptisms. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in our epistle reading from this evening that sin dwells within him. Paul, as a Christian, says that sin dwells in him and he does this in the present tense. He's talking about his present life as a Christian. But this brings up a problem. If sin, <clears throat> excuse me, if sin remains after our baptisms, does this mean that our baptism somehow did not work? Should we be rebaptized again and again? Maybe every single Sunday we come up here and confess our sins and then we are baptized yet again week after week after week. Maybe this time the baptism will stick. Or should we perhaps use more water in baptism as if more water might help us out a little bit more with this ongoing problem of sin. Maybe if we didn't sprinkle but dunked, maybe the result would be different. Baptized saints, your baptism did work and is working. Your baptism removed the guilt of sin, which means that your sin is without, get this, without God's wrath against it. You see, as long as you remain in your baptisms, your sin, which is in you, according to your old Adam, get this, cannot condemn you. We heard that in Romans 8.1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It does not say, Paul does not say there's no sin, but yet he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, in your baptisms, your sin is dead and harmless before God's anger as we rest in that baptism of grace. Permit me an opportunity to explain this a bit more. Let us imagine for a moment that we do a big lineup. We have a bunch of Christians and a bunch of godless pagans, and we line them up on a wall, kind of like we see in those movies. We line them up a wall, and then imagine we have an instrument that we can hold on to, and that instrument, we can come and wave it in front of the pagans and the Christians. And let's just say we don't know the Christians, we don't know the pagans, we mix them up back and forth on that wall. So we take this instrument and we wave it in front of every single person on that wall. And the instrument will, take, will show us who is a sinner and who is not a sinner. What would happen? What would be the result? You see, if we took that instrument, we waved it over every single person, over the godless pagan and the Christian alike, every single one would be guilty of sin. Every single person that that instrument was waved over top of would beep and indicate a sinner the Christian and the godless pagan alike. Furthermore, if this instrument could test for things such as anger and evil desires, it would show that every single person is exactly, get this, exactly the same. The godly and the ungodly would have the same motion of anger and evil desires, all the same. So what must we conclude? Are we to conclude that everyone in the lineup is guilty before God Almighty? Absolutely not. The reason why? The Christian is baptized. The Christian is wrapped in Christ's righteousness. The sin in the Christian is 
You got it. Forgiven. God does not count it against the Christian. Indeed, everyone in the lineup has the same sin, but the Christian in that lineup has an antidote for sin, a remedy for sin. They have Jesus and his gifts by grace through faith. And so we can confess that we are, yes, we are real sinners, just like the Apostle Paul, and just like everyone else around us. We can confess that no one is good, not even one, that is us and our neighbor. We can confess that we have real sin presently within us. However, we must never forget that this sin, that this sinful nature is not our friend, but it is our enemy. Just because we live with this old Adam does not make our old Adam a friend to us. Unlike pagans, this sinful nature within us is an unwelcome guest for you as the Christian. You see, when you were baptized, we've heard it before, and this is good to repeat, when we were baptized, we were put under the dominion of God's grace. Therefore, the sinful nature was kicked off the throne of our hearts and now finds itself surrounded by the Lord's grace and is constantly confronted by the new man in Christ. That's right, for you, the baptized, for you, the sinful nature is not a welcome guest, but a dead weight, if you will, dead weight that can do nothing but sin. So dear baptized Christians, since you still have the sinful nature, and since the sinful nature is within you, it actually means that every moment, every thought, every one of our words, and every single one of our deeds, it becomes a combat zone for you against your sinful old Adam. You are a sinner and a saint at the same time. And since you are a sinner and saint at the same time, you will experience both sin and trust in God in all of your works, all of your doings, as long as you are on this earth. Sure, there are battles in the culture to fight. No doubt about it. As we look out the walls of the church, there are battles in the culture. There will always be battles in the culture. And there will be battles against the devil. As we heard a couple weeks ago, the devil is out to kill and steal and destroy your faith and mine as well. But the battle itself, it's actually closest at hand right here, right here in our heart. The battle is right in our midst, right before us. And so practically speaking, at your job, the sinful nature will work to get you to grumble and gossip towards your boss. As a husband and wife, your sinful nature will cause you to resent your spouse and to quarrel. As a parent or grandparent, a school teacher, farmer, manufacturer, and a church member, well, the sinful nature is at work bringing about jealousy amongst you, jealousy amongst me, greed and fits of rage, factions, rebellion, and so forth in all of our vocations. And so we could practically say this, is there a problem with your job? Well, it's the sinful nature at work in you and your other co-worker. Is there a problem at school for you? Well, that sinful nature is at work in you and your fellow students. Is there a problem in your family? It's the sinful nature at work in your very heart and your family member. Is there a problem here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church? Yep, you bet. It's the sinful nature at work in your hearts and your neighbor and your other parishioner and even your pastors. Is there a problem in America? That's the sinful nature at work in you and your neighbor. You see, the sinful nature leads us to do not what we want to do, but do the very thing that we hate, as we heard from Paul this evening. The sinful nature itself, yes, that sinful nature itself, it is within us, and it leads us to cry out with the Apostle Paul, leads us to cry out, wretched man that I am. It's a sigh. Who will deliver me? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Yes, who will deliver us from this body of death? Who will deliver us from the treachery of the old Adam that infects all that we do? The good news of the gospel. The one who will deliver you is Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Dear baptized saints, in the midst of this agonizing struggle that we all have, this battle, this war with our old Adam that we have, we need to hear and hear it often that God gives deliverance to us through Jesus Christ. In fact, in Christ, the victory has already been won. Now, the ramifications of this cannot be quickly overlooked. It's not just a little sprinkle of good news and that's it. We must understand the ramifications of this. 
how it changes everything. You see, we continually pray for forgiveness of sins. And the reason why we do that is because Jesus has accomplished and freely gives us forgiveness free of charge. And when we confess our sins, because the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, we pray because we know that to be true, because he promises us that in his word. And so we confess that we are sinners. We don't hold that back. We confess it boldly because of the gospel itself, knowing that there's forgiveness for us in Christ that has already been accomplished. And so when we confess our sins, think of it this way. We're actually ratting out that old Adam because Jesus has come to call sinners such as you and me and to forgive us and to consider it well worthwhile. Think of it this way, dear friends. We come into this church every Sunday morning and we come to the Lord's church often and regularly to confess that we're poor, miserable sinners. We do that. Again, we talked about that at the very beginning. We say that every single week. But when we do this, think of it this way. It is like we come into this church together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we actually are dragging the sinful nature before the throne of grace. We're throwing ourselves upon the Lord's mercy together. And then right here, in this sanctuary, with our sinful nature laid bare before this font, the Lord, he delivers you and me by pouring out not wrath, not wrath, but grace, absolution, forgiveness, his body and blood upon our tongues and our mouths and into our hearts and into our bellies. He gives us salvation through his word and sacraments. He meets our confession. He meets the confession of our old Adam with forgiveness, life and salvation. And so we come to this church and this altar continually so that we might hear about the victorious one who has delivered us and is delivering us continually from this old Adam. We come to this holy house so that the Lord might continually create a clean heart within us and renew a right spirit within us so that you and I might continually fight the good fight, this war against the old Adam within until the day he finally takes us home unto himself. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. Jesus for us now. Jesus for us against our old Adam. And Jesus for us for eternity. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Ask the congregation to please stand. As we turn to the canticle on 231. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. I ask you to please turn to the Magnificat on page 934.
congregation will please be seated for the offering music as a way to remind the offering is in the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can also be mailed to the church office or conduct, conducted through the church website online. congregation to please stand for the Kyrie on 233. heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, giver and perfecter of our faith, we thank and praise you for continuing among us the preaching of your gospel for our instruction and edification. Send your blessing upon the word which has been spoken to us and by your Holy Spirit. Increase our saving knowledge of you that day by day we may be strengthened in the divine truth and remain steadfast in your grace. Give us strength to fight the good fight and by faith to overcome all the temptations of Satan, the flesh, and the world, so that we may finally receive the salvation of our souls. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Maybe see if our closing hymn, hymn number 433.
Romans 8.1 says it all for us. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. God be praised. As you war against the 